Were there any other early sectarian developments? Several other sects made their views known early on. When Ali was doing battle with the Umayyads to claim his rights to the Caliphate, a number of his troops seceded on the grounds that Ali was too lax in his appeal to religious principles in the conduct of battle. They judged Ali a serious sinner who was no longer worthy of the name Muslim. That group became known as the Kharijites, or Khawarij, those who secede. And a small remnant of their several factions live today largely in Oman on the Persian Gulf. Several other groups also expressed their opinions as to how far one might go in. Judging another person's suitability for true membership in the Muslim community. One of the more influential believed that only God could judge a person's soul. And that it was therefore best to postpone judgment on the matter. They were known as the Mergeites or Postponers. How do Shinto practitioners deal ritually with death and mourning? According to a saying, Shinto marries, Buddhism buries. During the Tokugawa era, 1600-1868, an imperial decree stipulated that only Buddhist priests should conduct funeral rites. Most cemeteries in Japan are connected to Buddhist temples rather than Shinto shrines. But there are exceptions to that general rule. And practitioners of Shinto have important beliefs and rituals concerning death and mourning. A major difference between Buddhist and Shinto practices is that Shinto rites never occur in shrines. Four shrines are strictly dedicated to the Kami. Shinto Tradition regards death as a form of evil and a serious source of pollution. Shinto belief and practice has been profoundly influenced by certain Confucian attitudes toward departed ancestors. And large numbers of Japanese still perform rites of ancestor veneration. Some Japanese families still follow the practice of enshrining a deceased person's symbols in a spirit house. Tamiya, placed beneath the home's kamidana, seven weeks after a funeral. Some of Japan's largest shrines are dedicated to memorializing the spirits of great. Human beings elevated to the status of Kami. Grief, Kibyaku, is associated with a prescribed period during which the experience of death renders family members impure. The bereaved family should stay away from shrines and refrain from Shinto ritual generally during that interval. In pre Buddhist times, the Japanese sometimes constructed monumental memorials to the dead. Historically, lay people performed Shinto funeral rituals, with main participants wearing white. Today, Shinto rites, led by priests, occur in homes or funeral establishments. Some shrines continue to perform memorial rites for those who have died in battle. How do trials or ordeals function in Shinto ritual?
Remnants of ancient practices reminiscent of trial by fire survive in several Shinto ceremonies. Most of which are still practiced, in relatively few locations. Unique to the Suwa Shrine in Nagasaki is a frightening ritual called Yotetsai. At the end of the purification and exorcism rituals. The chief priest of the shrine thrusts his hand into a kettle of boiling water. This rite dates back to the Shug Endo sect of late medieval times. Now it represents not the ascetic or magical power of ancient practitioners. Or the power to banish spirits possessing an unfortunate soul, but the need for radical purification. Some sects use a variation on this ritual. With a priest scattering scalding water on the main participant with a bamboo stick. A related ritual of trial involves walking over burning coals. Called chinkashiki, taming the fire. The ceremony involves circumambulating the bed of embers before walking across it. Anyone present may participate after the principal ritualists complete the ordeal. Again the purpose is purification, and prayers may include petitioning. The kami of the moon to exert his influence on the fire kami. What are some of the other religious days Hindus observe? Many of the lesser deities have special feasts widely observed by Hindus across sectarian lines. The fourth day of the bright half of Bhadrapada in early autumn marks the birthday of Shiva's son Ganesha. This was originally a Dravidian fertility festival associated with early harvest. Another fertility feast celebrates the emergence of the Ganges from a sage's ear one of a number of metaphors for the sacred origins of the river. Observed in early summer. The day marks a time during which devotees can cleanse themselves of ten specific evils. Some also celebrate a late summer festival called Tying the Lucky Threads. The day recalls how the wife of Vedic storm deity Indra saved her husband from a demon by slipping a magic string on his wrist. Sisters do the same for their brothers and some celebrants use the occasion as a renewal of their investiture with the sacred thread of initiation. What is the ritual details of circumcision? Circumcision the removal of the foreskin of the penis is performed on all male Jewish children on the eighth day after their birth. It is also performed on male converts to Judaism. The operation is called for in Genesis 17 and is considered the strongest required sign of adherence to Judaism. It is also a powerful symbol of the covenant of Abraham. As implied by the Talmudic tractate Netarim 31b. Circumcision was originally performed because the foreskin was considered to be a blemish. To attain a state of perfection, the foreskin had to be removed. During ancient times, some Hellenistic Jews especially those whose loins would be exposed in the course of athletics or public bathing had an operation performed to conceal their circumcisions. 
later, in order to prevent Jewish men from hiding their circumcisions. Rabbis added the requirement that the entire force can not just the end portion be excised completely. This is known as periot, the laying bare of the glands. An additional requirement was added at a later period directing that the circumciser apply his lips to the penis in order to draw the blood that flowed from the incision. For hygienic reasons, this practice was modified to allow the blood to be drawn by an absorbent material like cotton. For a baby boy, the circumcision must take place on the eighth day after birth. Unless medical reasons prevent it. Only one exception is allowed to the universal requirement that Jewish infant boys be circumcised. If two previous sons have died as a result of the operation, thereby implying hereditary hemophilia, the third and all subsequent sons are exempted from circumcision. The day of circumcision for an infant boy is considered a time of celebration for the entire community. Customarily, the father of the boy hands his son to the circumciser, who recites appropriate prayers and typically invokes Elijah. The ceremony is often followed by a religious meal of celebration. What is the importance of the month of Ramadan? During pre Islamic times, the month called Ramadan, high summer, was religiously significant as a time during which the Arab tribes observed a truce from all hostilities. Of all the months the Quran mentions only Ramadan by name, identifying it as the month during which the scripture was revealed. Scripture suggests that the initial divine revelation is the reason for the practice of fasting throughout the month. Ramadan begins with the sighting of the new moon on the last night of the eighth month. Each day, from dawn until sunset, Muslims are enjoined to fast from all food and liquid, as well as from sexual activity and other forms of sensual pleasure. Fasting also means refraining from negative attitudes and complaining and developing a sense of solidarity with those who suffer from want all year long. After Muslims break the fast with some water and dates, they eat a meal before retiring. Before dawn they may have another meal, but limit other forms of celebration during the entire month. Special prayers are scheduled in mosques, along with the recitation of one of 30 sections of the Quran. Completing the entire sacred text over the 30 nights. A number of important dates fall during Ramadan. Most important is the night of power. One of the odd-numbered nights among the last 10, usually observed on the 27th. Muslims believe that God's initial revelation to Muhammad makes this the holiest time of the entire year. Other important times during Ramadan include the birthday of the martyr Hussein, 6th, death of Muhammad's first wife. Khadija, 10th, the Battle of Badr, a key event in 625, the 17th, the retaking of Mecca in 630, 19th. The deaths of Ali and of the 8th Shi'i Imam, Ali Reza, 21st, and Ali's birthday, 22nd. 
where Muslims are in the majority or a very sizable minority. The rhythm of life slows dramatically during Ramadan. At the sighting of the next new moon, all rejoice in the feast of fast breaking, Id al Fitr. What do Jews call God? Various important terms appear through the Hebrew Bible. Torah uses the words Elohim, a kind of plural form related to the same Semitic root. El, from which the Islamic name for God, Allah, derives. But the word Yahweh is a still more central term. Sometimes translated as he who is, in connection with God's identifying himself to Moses. Through the burning bush as I am who am or I will be who I will be, a high Asher a high. Many Jews choose not to pronounce this most sacred name of God. When reading scripture they prefer to substitute the Hebrew Hashem. The name, every time the word Yahweh appears. Similarly, many Jewish publications in English print simply GD in place of God. Out of reverence for the sacred word. Another term, Adonai, my Lord, is also significant here. Some people combine the vowels from Adonai with the consonants of Yahweh to get Jehovah. This linguistic compromise allows people to both say and not say the sacred name of God. What are the main architectural and ritual elements of a major Shinto shrine? At the heart of a major shrine is a complex of three units called the Hangu. For a Jingu, Hancha for a Jinjia. This central area, all oriented to the south as in Chinese sacred structures, houses the shrine's principal deity. Within the Hangu are the Hayden, Hayden and Honden arranged front to rear along the south-north central axis. The outer and most public of the spaces is called the Hayden, or Worship Hall. Where devotees gather individually or in small groups for special blessings and other rituals. Most people who come to the shrine without prior arrangements for special ceremonial. Ministrations from the priestly staff perform their brief prayers in front of the Hayden. But if the staff are performing rituals inside, those outside are welcome to observe. From that hall, worshippers can look across an interior courtyard to the central structure. The Hayden or Offering Hall, where only the priestly staff perform more sacred rituals. From there, in turn, the celebrants can see, sometimes across yet another courtyard. The Honden, the Shinto equivalent of the Holy of Holies. There, behind closed doors and visible to no one, the Kami reside. Also on the grounds of many large shrines one may find subordinate shrines called Beku which house related major deities masha house lesser deities some shrines also have small buddhist temples called jingji shrine temples on the property remnants of the ancient connections between the two traditions
Who were the Sadducees and are they still around? Around the time the Pharisees became important players in Jewish history. The Sadducees, Tzedukim, also emerged. They held that only the Torah was authentic revelation. Repudiating the Pharisaic emphasis on the full Bible as well as all subsequent oral tradition. They also denied the Pharisees' teaching of the soul's immortality and bodily resurrection. As the Pharisees presented themselves as the heirs of Moses and of his authority as lawgiver, the Sadducees anchored their authority in that of Moses' priestly brother Aaron. More specifically, the Sadducees may have gotten their name because of their claim to be directly descended from Zadok, the high priest in Solomon's temple. The Sadducees had struck a compromise with the Hasmoneans, agreeing to support the rulers if they would officially nullify the Pharisaic teaching on the validity of the oral law. In exchange, the Sadducees would tolerate the Hasmonean claim to priestly authority. A stunning accommodation indicative of the enmity between Pharisees and Sadducees. When the Pharisees were restored to favor under the ruler Alexandra, 76 to 67 BCE, they in turn struck a deal by which they would sanction the priesthood of the Sadducees. In exchange for the Sadducees' acceptance of the binding force of oral Torah. During the time of Jesus, the high priest named Caiaphas was a Sadducee. But the sect disappeared along with the temple. Do Muslims believe in predestination or fatalism? A common misperception of Islamic tradition is that God exercises such minute and perfect control over all things that human actions have no bearing on the individual's ultimate destiny. When Muslims use the expression God willing, they do not mean to suggest that human beings are mere marionettes dancing at the whim of the divine puppeteer. They are simply reminding themselves that God is ultimately in charge of everything. Regardless of individual human preferences. True, the Quran often describes how God both guides and leads astray whomever he chooses. But that does not suggest that God is capricious or spiteful. Only that God is God and that lesser beings ought not to take God's sovereignty for granted even for a second. Equally often, the Quran reminds believers how God lays out his signs in creation and in the individual heart. Adding perhaps you will understand. Muslims believe in God's justice. The Quran insists that each person will be held accountable for his or her actions at judgment. But since God is just, Muslims conclude that human beings exercise a significant freedom of choice otherwise. Accountability at the judgment would be a sham, a cruel hoax to which God hardly needs to resort. All in all, Muslim tradition seeks to maintain the delicate balance between belief in God's absolute power and a limited, but more than adequate, human freedom to choose either good or evil. What is Chinese imperial tradition, CIT, and when did it begin?
long before the time of Confucius. A system of beliefs and practices had developed around the role of the emperor in cosmic affairs. The Chinese had come to regard the emperor as the son of heaven. He bore the awesome responsibility of securing the welfare of all his subjects. By discerning and executing faithfully the will, or mandate, of heaven. Though the emperor was called son of heaven, he was not considered a deity. He was rather one who had the ultimate sanction for exercising authority on earth. So long as he maintained contact with the heavenly mandate. Whenever a ruler failed to see that his people enjoyed universal justice, the people could justifiably conclude that heaven's mandate had passed to a more worthy leader. Revolution was the solution. Chinese imperial tradition had its pantheon of deities arranged in several hierarchical levels. So that the earthly royal administration appeared to mirror the heavenly. CIT did not revolve around a sacred scripture. Nor did it have a separate ecclesiastical structure or ordained priesthood. It did, however, have its own equivalent of religious doctrine. Elaborate rituals comparable in form and content to those of many major religious traditions. And a hierarchical organization complete with ritual specialists. CIT is an integral part of the religious history of China. Since it formed the broad backdrop against which nearly the whole of that history has been played out. What is meant by the phrase resurrection of the body? Christians believe that all who have died will rise again. When Jesus Christ comes in glory at the end of the world, humanity's rising will be patterned on the resurrection of Jesus. He who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus and bring us with you into his presence, 2 Corinthians 4.14. Christians believe that human beings are called not to be simply souls or spirits, but to be fully alive, in body and in soul. Thus, the entire human person body and soul is destined to share eternal life with God in heaven. Have dreams and visions or other spirit manifestations been important in Shinto tradition? Shinto legends are full of famous figures who have enjoyed or barely survived encounters with the spirit world. Many religiously prominent individuals have claimed to receive divine visitations and privileged communications in dreams. Various spirits, even evil ones, Goryo, are capable of making their presence known for the purpose of delivering a message. These spirits, also called living human kami, are a hitogame can return in their human form to make things both positive and negative happen in the land of the living. Certain famous people, like Prince Shoto Kutaishi, 574-622, and poet calligrapher Shugawara Michizain, 845-903, 
to whom over 10,000 shrines are dedicated, who died untimely or violent deaths later became kami. But could also exert unhappy influence if not dealt with properly. This is a striking amalgam of positive and negative powers in one spirit. Such a spirit can manifest itself in frightening apparitions as well as in blessings. What were some critical events in Islam's earliest years? Over the next 23 years or so, Muhammad continued to preach the word God had spoken directly to him. At the heart of the message was the notion of surrender. The root meaning of the Arabic word Islam, pronounced is L-A-A-M, to the one true God. His early preaching called for social justice and equality and condemned oppression of the poor by the wealthy and powerful. Muhammad belonged to a powerful tribe called the Quraysh, who exercised considerable control over the lives of the Meccans generally. But Muhammad's family and the clan of which they were a part were among the poorer and less influential within the tribe. Muhammad's preaching did not endear him to the Quraysh, who made life difficult for the small community of Muslims. In 622, Muhammad and his followers made the crucial decision to move north to the city of Yathrib whose representatives had offered the young community sanctuary. This emigration or hijra marked the official beginning of the Muslim calendar. Muhammad the Prophet became a statesman as well. And Yathrib became known as Madinat and Nabi, the city of the Prophet, or Medina for short. The Muslim community grew rapidly doing battle with the Meccans and eventually regaining access to Mecca in 630. Is there such a thing as Confucian fundamentalism? Confucian scholars have devised a wide range of methods for interpreting the classical sources. Many of the central concepts in Confucian thought are simply too large and subtle to interpret literally. Take the notion of the mandate of heaven, for example. Dynasties have come and gone frequently in China's long history and many have interpreted dynastic decay as a sure indication that the emperor had lost his contact with heaven's will. That is an easy enough judgment to make in retrospect. But using the mandate theory as a criterion for deciding whether the people are justified in bringing down this regime now is a much more complicated matter. Some interpreters have chosen to apply the criteria of the classical sources directly to current events. They have their Christian counterparts, for example. In those who have discerned portents of the apocalypse in the world around them at various times in history. Some Confucian texts have lent themselves more readily to literal interpretation so much so that their prescriptions have become the very fabric of life for countless Chinese who have never set foot in a Confucian temple. Those are books like the Liji. With its detailed descriptions of ritualized relationships across the full spectrum of human activity.
What is a priest? A socio-religious class called priesthood has ancient roots in various traditions. Some priestly classes have perpetuated themselves through heredity. Some have been intimately associated with the performance of sacrificial ritual, whether bloody or not. And are typically connected with temple or church institutions both large and small. In some traditions, priests have been celibate as a group. But in most marriage is a prerequisite for all priests. Most of all, the priest functions as the chief ritual specialist and is often considered a mediator of spiritual power. An indispensable connection between the divine and the human. Even in societies where a hereditary priesthood is the norm. Some type of specialized training is generally expected and provided. More often than not priestly education aims to steep the trainee in the sacred text and its ritual uses. As well as in the ritual actions the priest can be expected to perform hundreds or even thousands of times a year. On the whole it is safe to say that priests in most traditions are trained less as professional theologians than as public servants commissioned to facilitate the devotional life of the community. Special rituals called ordination in some traditions designed to dedicate Individuals to the priesthood often bring the time of training to its culmination. Priesthoods are typically restricted to male membership, though there are some exceptions. What kinds of smaller religious organizations do Christians belong to? In addition to the various monastic orders that are still an integral part of religious life in the Anglo and Roman Catholic as well as Eastern communities. A number of non-monastic religious and lay organizations have also made significant contributions. There are several types of organizations for men and women fully committed to various kinds of religious life. Members of those formally known as orders, such as the Society of Jesus or the Jesuits, take solemn vows of perpetual poverty, chastity, and obedience. Members of congregations take simple vows that can be either perpetual or renewable at set intervals. Most religious organizations belong in this category. Lay institutes are like congregations, except that most or all members of the former are not ordained to the priesthood. As with the Daughters or Charity or Christian Brothers. In addition, a number of the orders strictly so-called, such as the Dominicans and Franciscans have second orders, for female members, and third orders, also called tertiaries, for lay affiliates. Although the Roman Catholic tradition is more structured in this respect than most others, almost all Christian churches provide multiple organizational opportunities. Designed to allow members fuller participation in the life of the community. These groups typically revolve around some specific socio-religious focus. Such as church maintenance, social outreach, or the interface of religion and politics.
What is meant by the term Zionism? In general Zionism means the modern movement of Jewish return to the holy mountain of Zion in the hope of reclaiming it as the heart of the biblical promised land. Nathan Birnbaum coined the usage in 1890. In 1896 Theodor Herzl organized the political movement that has borne the name ever since. Herzl convened the first of many Zionist congresses at Basel in 1897. Heim Weizmann 1874 to 1952 was one of the most influential leaders of the movement. He was a powerful presence from the negotiation of the Balfour Declaration of 1917, a watershed document that ultimately made serious talk of a Jewish state possible. Right through negotiations for Israeli statehood in 1947, Weizmann also served as Israel's first president. Zionism has, to be sure, been a bone of contention because of the political and social implications of so dramatic a reshaping of what had formerly been called Palestine. How would you sum up the history of Confucianism? During the first couple of centuries after the time of Confucius, two major thinkers developed the beginnings of what we now call Confucianism. Mencius, or Mengzi, 371 to 289 BCE, and Sunzi, d. 215 BCE codified the teachings of the master into the foundations of a political philosophy. Emperor Qin Shi Huangdi, 221-210 BCE, displeased with the emerging movement, tried to suppress it by burning all the Confucian texts. Before that emperor died, in 210 BCE, he had succeeded in transforming feudal China into a centralized bureaucracy, but Confucianism survived. Under the new Han dynasty, 206 BCE-220 CE, the state espoused Confucianism as its core ideology. Confucianism took institutional shape as a system for training the empire's bureaucrats and officials thereby strengthening the cultural elite known as the literati for the next several centuries. Confucianism's prestige dwindled as Buddhism's star rose with increasing imperial patronage. During the southern and northern, 265 to 581 CE, Sui, 581 to 618, and Tang dynasties. 618 to 906, Confucian ritual and literati authority held on. Criticizing Buddhism as an insidious import and enjoying sporadic periods of notoriety. Confucianism returned to prominence during the Song dynasty. 960-1279, as a result of the Neo-Confucian revival. Scholars finalized the canon of the five classics and four books, plus several subsidiary works. Official Neo-Confucian philosophies drifted away from traditional beliefs in a transcendent divine heaven. Emphasizing ethics and social responsibility. But a cult centered around Confucius survived. 
During the last of the Chinese dynasties, the Qing, or Manchu, 1644-1911. A generally strong literati class continued to promote an increasingly static and dogmatic form of Confucian orthodoxy. The last emperor fell with the arrival of Sun Yat-sen's New Republic and the literati became functionally obsolete. Still, the leaders of the Republic held Confucius up as the epitome of Chinese culture. When Mao Zedong's communist movement began its rise in the 1930s, the chairman declared himself fed up with Confucius and the old ways. In response, the Republican nationalist movement insisted that Confucianism represented all genuinely Chinese values. As the nationalists fled the mainland and established themselves in Taiwan under Zhang Kai shek in 1949, overt acknowledgement of Confucian tradition went with them. Is there such a thing as a deist saint? Perhaps the closest thing in Daoism to what many people mean by Saint is the ideal of human development called the sage, Zhen Ren. Unlike ordinary people, the sage keeps his knowledge hidden. Because there is no need to impress or persuade others. A sage is thus like the silent, unobtrusive Dao. Neither does the sage labor over the right course of action. For love is squandered when spent on specific deeds rather than lavished equally on all. The sage understands that failing to yield is not to be confused with courage. The sage knows how to give without being emptied, how to take in without being filled. Completely in harmony with nature, the sage acts without intent, learns without studying intently. Chinese religious traditions often have elevated otherwise. Ordinary human beings to a status above the merely human. But there is no standard formal process by which this elevation takes place. In this respect Daoism is closer to Islam than to Christianity, for example, where sainthood requires elaborate and lengthy investigation and verification. Emperors and others in authority have sometimes announced honors of this kind by decree. But sages are generally acknowledged as such as a result of grassroots movements rather than by pronouncement from on high. There is at least one other distinctive feature of the making of a deist sage. Whereas saints in some other traditions arrive at a level of spiritual perfection as a result of divine grace, the deist sage is a product of self-help. What are monks and nuns? A surprising number of religious traditions include several different options or styles of affiliation for their members. The vast majority of members in every tradition belong to the broad category often referred to as laypersons. Within the orbit of the larger communities there are generally numerous social Organizations of an ostensibly religious orientation open to lay believers. But another, more restrictive, 
category of membership is available, for example, to virtually all Buddhists. Many Christians and Hindus, and to Muslims in a number of regions where various Sufi groups thrive. These organizations are often called orders or confraternities. The Buddhist Sangha is arguably the oldest continuously functioning order of its kind on earth. Dating to the late 6th or early 5th century BCE. In some traditions, these orders have devised separate but parallel structures for men and women. Two very different lifestyles have been important in the history of monasticism. When members live together in community at all times. They are called cenobites, from the Greek koinos and bios, common life. Those who choose to live alone or as hermits are called anchorites. From the Greek anachorean, to withdraw. Many of the orders originate as small circles of devotees gathered around a charismatic figure. In the case of Buddhism, the foundational figure himself. Some eventually grow into complex organizations with elaborate hierarchical systems of succession to leadership and authority. Larger orders often split into sub-orders, with members breaking off and founding their own groups. Either because of a disagreement over spirit or practice, or to simplify administration and governance. Orders typically develop a system of training, beginning with a period of apprenticeship in which the novice or aspirant learns the order's ways and demonstrates aptitude for the life. Attaining full membership, the monk, or nun, or brother in some cases, assumes ordinary responsibilities and shares fully in the community life. Some are asked to perform internal administrative duties, and become part of the governance structure. Orders can be either local, with only one or a few houses in a city or region. Or more widespread, with foundations worldwide governed from a central administrative office. Some traditions also have organizations that serve a population whose religious commitments place them somewhere between lay and professionally religious. These are sometimes called third orders. Theology as a concept in the 3rd century Mediterranean world he term theology was generally used by the Greeks to describe the character of Theogonies and to designate critical studies of Greek mythology. Plato in the Republic, Aristotle in his Meteorology and Cicero in The Nature of the Gods, came to approximate the later historical use of the term. The Neoplatonists, however, seem to have been the first to consider theology as the science of God. The term is altogether missing in the New Testament and in the Apostolic Fathers. Early stirrings in the development of the concept of theology are to be found in the writings of Irenaeus of Lyons and Clement of Alexandria. The former was one of the first Christians to attempt to impose a rational economy upon God in his recapitulation theory. And the latter's stromata was an early attempt to impose order upon divine revelation in general. The apologists, themselves educated as philosophers or lawyers. Especially felt the need to present the educated pagan world with a philosophically coherent expression of faith. While Justin Martyr attempted judiciously to weave Platonism into the Christian scheme. 
Tertullian developed the technical terminology to be employed by subsequent theologians. Hippolytus, the first Christian to employ the word theologian, was seriously concerned about launching an orderly investigation into the psychology and economy of God. In the 3rd century, Origen, molded in the concepts of Middle Platonism and to some extent of Stoicism, greatly influenced the emergence of theology as a sophisticated, philosophical pursuit. The apostles, he felt, left the grounds of their statements to be examined by those who had the charismata of the Spirit. Knowledge of the divine world, wisdom, skill in technical tools, and holiness of life. His express aim was to erect a clearly stated connected body of truth based on illustration and argumentation and arrived at by the correct method. Even the title of his great work, On First Principles, betrays his intention to deal intelligently with God and heavenly beings and with men, the material world, and free will and its consequences. Origen was forced to rely heavily on the use of allegory to resolve contradictions, explain difficult passages, and correct misstatements purporting to be facts. What are the ten paramitas, great virtues, of the Bodhisattva? The following ten virtues are to be attained after continuing efforts in numerous past lives as Buddha to be. Charity morality renunciation wisdom effort patience truth determination universal love equanimity. Who are Sunni Muslims? About 85 to 90 percent of the world's Muslims consider themselves Sunni. Their historic patrimony derives directly from the Prophet himself as institutionalized in the Caliphate. Sunni tradition has been embodied in most of the regimes that have held political power from Morocco to Indonesia. Since the early Middle Ages until early modern times. The ideal of the Caliph, legitimate successor to Muhammad. As the spiritual as well as temporal ruler of all Muslims, has survived largely as a distant dream since the Mongols destroyed Baghdad in 1258. And since the last Ottoman Sultan fell from power in the 1920s. Virtually no Muslim ruler has been even nominally regarded as a universal ruler. Some Muslims still entertain the possibility of a resurgence of the Caliphate. But that is definitely a minority view. What is a jinn? You've probably heard stories about the magical powers of genies who appear when someone rubs a magic lamp just right. The word genie comes from the Arabic word jinn. Which refers to creatures of smokeless fire who inhabit a mysterious realm somewhere between the human and the divine. According to popular lore in Muhammad's time, the jinns would eavesdrop on the heavenly councils and offer to divulge their secrets to a soothsayer, called a kahin, pronounced kaahin, who uttered the proper formula. 
some of Muhammad's early critics charged that he was not a prophet but just another Majanun. Pronounced Majnoon, one possessed by a jinn. To call someone Majanun is to question the person's credibility as well as sanity. Countless jinns inhabit the world, some mischievous and some helpful and benevolent. King Solomon had the special gift of taming the jinn and enlisting them for the construction of his majestic temple. Particularly troublesome are the frighteningly ugly jinns called ghouls. From which we get the word ghoul. For those who do not know how to handle them, jinns can make life unpleasant, but their powers are limited. Is there a distinctively Confucian ethic? A Confucian formulation of the universal golden rule at first strikes the ear as rather negative and passive. Do not do to others what you do not want done to you. But the Confucian ethic turns out to be overwhelmingly active and positive. Because of its emphasis on cultivating the natural human capacity for virtue. The master's positive approach revolves around several key concepts. First and foremost is Li, principle, or propriety. Consisting of a whole range of directives for human behavior. Much of Li arises from the customs that embody the spirit of community. When people can rely on propriety in all relationships. As enshrined in time-honored practice, they experience assurance and freedom in their relationships. Confucius gathered a huge catalog of social rituals, not out of antiquarian curiosity, but as a way of preserving what he considered the best of tradition. Ritual propriety is not meant to confine, but to give a sense of lightness and freedom. Without Li, he thought, there can be no justice, no morality. For a society without propriety has no foundation in respect. Of equal importance is the notion of Shu, reciprocity in interpersonal relationships. Reciprocity is essential to putting Li into action. For it governs the five principal human relationships and the ten associated virtues. In the father-son relationship, the father must cultivate kindness, the son reverence. The elder brother must deal gently with his younger brother, who responds with respect. A mutuality of faithfulness and obedience should characterize husband-wife relationships. Let all elders be considerate of those younger, and expect deference in return. Finally, a ruler must strive to treat subjects with benevolence and benefit from their loyalty as a result. What are some of the main varieties of Shinto officials or specialists? Shinto tradition refers to the priesthood in general as either Shin's Hoku or Kanashi. Larger shrines with full priestly staffs distinguish among a number of ranks. The chief priest is called the Guji, generally the highest ranking local official. Guji might have oversight of up to 30 subordinate shrines. The Ganguji is second in command and oversees a staff of several lower ranks as well. 
including junior assistant chief priests, Shingonguji. Senior priests are called Neki, assistant senior priests Gon Neki, and regular priests. Shutan or Kyujo, fill out the ranks of male staff. A national ranking system also distinguishes among priests by acknowledging their levels of learning with the equivalent of academic degrees, named purity, jokai. Brightness, maikai, righteousness, sikai, and uprightness, chakai. Young unmarried women, called shrine maidens, maiko, function rather like deaconesses. Dressed in striking vermilion skirts and white blouses. They assist in blessing rituals, run the shrine shop, and perform sacred dance. Maiko traditionally begin their association with the shrine and training for service as sacred children. Highest in rank is the unique position called Saishu, found only at the ISE shrine and held by a woman. She is an imperial princess with the symbolic title Master of the Matsuri, Festivals. Assisting her is a priest with the rank of Daigyuji, Great Chief Priest, a function unique to ISE. In the imperial household, ritual specialists have either of two ranks. The Shoten parallels the shrine rank of senior priest. The Shoten Ho that of assistant senior priest. But the emperor himself or a personal delegate presides. Much as the Chinese sovereign once did, at over two dozen annual ceremonies. What is the most important deist observance? A grand affair called the Ritual of Cosmic Renewal occurs at varying intervals in different places. It was once on a 60-year cycle, according to the ancient calendar reckoning calculated. With the branches and stems. Some temples celebrate this way as often as every 10 years now. Whenever a community erects a new temple it is time for a renewal ritual. This major festival belongs to a larger category called Xiao. Ritual specialists from the so-called Black Hat Group have exclusive rights to officiate in these events. A standard feature is recitation from the Jade Emperor scripture. And the focus of prayer is on seeking blessings of all kinds for the future. Massive organizational efforts precede the larger celebrations. They include interviewing prospective high priests from whom the committee can choose a leader. Who will then arrange for a full staff of ritual specialists. Full-scale festivities require extensive construction of temporary altars or shrines. Celebrations nowadays typically go on for from three to five days. Though they formerly lasted as long as nearly two months. What are the principal Confucian and CIT rites of passage? Confucian tradition prescribes a full range of very detailed ritual procedures to be observed for various family. As well as a few public, occasions. They differ from rites of passage in many other traditions in. That they generally do not assume an overtly religious form. 
Confucian teaching places enormous emphasis on ritualized attentiveness to every detail of daily family life. All of that occurs within the larger presumed context of life under heaven and in a society that is at least potentially just and harmonious. In pre-modern times, many Chinese practiced rites of initiation for young women and men alike. Families conferred on young men a hat and a name symbolizing maturity. Young women received some new clothes and had their hair done specially. More recently, Chinese social custom has linked these rituals to marriage. Now considered the primary sign of adulthood. Is there a regular, standard Shinto group liturgical worship? Communal worship is not a regular feature of Shinto liturgical practice. People may arrive at a shrine in large numbers. But they generally do not gather to worship as a large congregation. Individual and small group worship is the norm, whether for brief impromptu visits. Made outside the shrine or for more elaborate priestly rituals in the worship hall. A distinctive feature of Shinto architecture is the absence of worship spaces large enough to accommodate sizable congregations. By contrast, the bigger Japanese Buddhist temples accommodate sizable groups in a single worship space. Even in larger Shinto shrines, the parts of the worship facility open to the public are in any case not fully enclosed. Being very much at the mercy of cold weather is the price of wanting a sacred space to be as much in tune with nature as possible. This also reflects the underlying sense that people build community through other activities but perform their most intimate spiritual duties as individuals or families. What is eschatology? Eschatology derives from two Greek words meaning the study, logos, of the last things, eschata. The so-called four last things include death, judgment, heaven, and hell, and the study of them is often called individual eschatology. In addition, cosmic eschatology encompasses religious teaching. Concerning how history and the world as we know it will come to an end. Although use of the term eschatology has been especially characteristic of the study of the Abrahamic traditions, it can also be useful in describing important aspects of belief in the religious traditions of Asian origin, religious traditions of Middle Eastern origin have generally developed linear views of history whereby time is said to have a beginning, a middle, and an end, never again to be repeated. Their eschatologies explore the final and definitive transformations that will befall both individuals and the universe. Traditions of Asian origin tend to favor cyclical views of time. Although each cycle of time is unimaginably long, it is only part of a vast unending potentiality for further variations. 
As a result, though Asian traditions do talk of various realms of reward and punishment hereafter. They generally do not consider any of those realms to be a truly final destination for the individual. There is always the possibility of yet another existence and another outcome. Many traditions talk of an accountability after death. Often describing it as a meeting between the individual soul and a judge or counsel charged with meeting out just desserts. Only a few traditions worldwide, such as Japan's Shinto, have weakly developed notions of afterlife. What rites do Buddhists practice at home? Many devout Buddhists pray daily at home before their domestic shrine. A miniature version of the temple or monastic oratory. They show reverence to the image of the Buddha with incense, flower offerings, and a lighted candle. All three of these simple symbols bring home the central realization of impermanence. They give pleasure to the worshipper, who should enjoy them while they last. Unburned incense is analogous a person who does not use his or her talents. A lotus flower is a reminder of the Buddha's being rooted in. The muck of real life but blossoming above it and in spite of it. These symbols also represent homage to the Buddha, not because the Buddha needs or enjoys that. But because it focuses the mind on his message. Rituals also include reciting the three refuges and reaffirming the commitment to the five precepts. Prayers of petition include the same sorts of things people of many traditions ask for happiness, success, longevity, and salvation. Mahayana devotees might wear a small rosary around a wrist, as they often do when worshipping in the temple. Have women exercised leadership in Confucianism or CIT? Confucian tradition is staunchly patriarchal. Long-standing practice all over Asia, as a result of Confucian influence has until only recently expected women to obey father before marriage, husband during marriage, and oldest son when her husband dies. Education under classical Confucian direction was limited to males. That is no longer the case in societies that still acknowledge. However indirectly, their Confucian heritage. As for CIT, a number of empresses and princesses came to prominence over the centuries. But here too the leadership was male. Empresses were generally in charge of the so-called inner court. Empress mothers frequently had duties in matters of state and thus were often more active in the outside world. Women were never allowed in the main halls of the Forbidden City's outer court. Except on the day a new empress married her emperor. Is there such a thing as converting to Daoism? In relatively recent times, Daoism has attracted increasing interest among people outside China. 
a quick scan of internet sites affords a fair impression of contemporary Euro-American interpretations of the ancient Chinese tradition. Many non-Chinese who are attracted to Taoism gravitate toward the philosophical rather than to the theistic or religious elements. Some proponents of New Age beliefs have adopted the use of Taoist divinatory techniques. Especially the interpretation of the hexagrams by consulting the Yijing. But on the whole, non Chinese who express an active interest in Taoism do not convert to the tradition the way one would when becoming, say, a Muslim or a Christian. Since Taoism is so intertwined with an integrated worldview that is profoundly Chinese, it is almost a contradiction in terms to talk of becoming a deist. Who is the Bodhisattva Guan Yin? Next to the various Buddhas. Guan Yin is certainly one of the most important and popular sacred figures in Buddhist tradition. This Bodhisattva began life, mythically speaking, as a male guardian figure named Avalokiteshvara, the Lord who looks down. Known in China as Guan Yin and in Japan as Kanon, he was originally one of Varakana's. The central figure among the five transcendent Buddhas, attendants. Presiding over the cosmic northwest, Avalokiteshvara came to be particularly associated with compassion when paired with the Bodhisattva Manjushri, who represented wisdom. Boundless in his care for all, the compassionate one has appeared with multiple heads and arms one of the few bodhisattvas to be commonly so depicted. As Mahayana communities grew in China, Guan Yin's perfect compassion gradually transformed him into a female bodhisattva. With a thousand arms and eleven heads, Guan Yin often has a decidedly feminine countenance. But she appears more often as a kindly woman smiling gently and inclined slightly toward her devotees. In more recent times, people have begun to call her more ordinary human. Manifestation the goddess of mercy, a convenient but misleading epithet that resulted from Buddhism's interaction with Chinese popular religious lore. In Japan, the thousand-armed, eleven-headed canon often appears in multiple images within the same temple. Sometimes even as a life-sized sculpture. Popular lore claims that each canon has a different face to symbolize. This bodhisattva's undivided attention to every single person on earth. What gender-related issues are important for Muslims? Muslim tradition places great emphasis on understanding and facilitating social relations according to gender-appropriate roles and religiously acceptable behavior. In some societies, women are excluded from certain occupations. But in most instances those are cultural rather than explicitly religious norms. For example, American Muslim women participate in a wider range of professions than do their sisters in some other countries. 
non-Muslim American professional women may experience the same. Kinds of occupational limitations as their Muslim counterparts All societies and cultures have their gender biases. And religious sanction and justification often becomes inextricably intertwined with them. Largely because religious argument can be a useful element in social control. Gender-related restrictions by which many devout Muslims abide are largely family matters. Arising from the belief that God has ordained certain tasks to men and certain others to women. Gender and sex differences are real, they observe, and part of a larger plan. Traditional family life calls for a division of labor and a clear understanding of individual and collective priorities. Non-Muslims sometimes conclude that Muslim women who choose to observe a dress code are oppressed. Talk to the Muslim women, many of whom are successful physicians, lawyers and engineers and you get a different perspective.